Good morning. Welcome to our River Road Presbyterian Church uh, online. This morning, our passage of scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Hear the word of God. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly, far more than we all can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful prayer? But did you know that, notice the paradox in the prayer? Ephesians says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend and know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's a paradox. How can you know anything that surpasses knowledge? It surpasses knowledge. So how can you know it? Well, I think the secret is to begin to grasp the dimensions of God's love, its width, its length, its height, its depth. Ephesians prays that we comprehend the width of the love of Christ. Well, how wide is the love of Christ? Well, it is really wide. In fact, it is so wide that it embraces everybody. Our passage from Ephesians hints at the wideness of God's embrace when it says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. The love of God reaches out to every family on earth. Now, not everybody gets this or understands it because it's hard to grasp. People struggle to understand how wide God's love is. Ken Parker was once a grand dragon in the Ku Klux Klan. He earned this title by recruiting a lot of new members to the Klan. But he left the Klan for the neo-Nazis because they were harder core and he was looking for something that was harder core. He and his buddies marched in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And in his own words, he went there looking to start a race war. On the day that he went, he wore a uniform of the, his neo-Nazi group it was a black shirt with two lightning bolts sewn onto the collar. When the rally was declared an unlawful assembly, he and his fellow neo-Nazis headed back to the parking garage to regroup. And it was there that he met the filmmaker Dia Khan, who was filming the event for a documentary on hate groups. Parker recalls meeting Khan, and all I can remember of that meeting really is her kindness. He says, I pretty much had heat exhaustion after the rally because we like to wear our black uniforms and I drank a Red Bull before the event. I was hurting and she was trying to make sure I was okay. After helping him, she asked if he would be willing to share his views for her documentary. And in the film, you can hear him spewing hatred of Jews and gays and people of color. And yet, even as he was being filmed, Khan was so gentle that you can hear his proclamations becoming less certain. You see, her kindness got under his skin. Parker says that Khan was so completely respectful to me and my fiance the whole time so that she got me thinking, she's a really nice lady. 
just because she's got darker skin and believes in a different God than the God I believe in, why am I hating these people? And over the next months, his doubts grew. And then one day, an African-American neighbor was hosting a cookout at the pool of his apartment complex. He was watching that, and as the sun set and the crowd thinned, he approached the man. The man's name was William McKinnon. Now, he knew there was something about, different about William McKinnon, but he didn't know at first that he was the pastor of All Saints Holiness Church. But they talked for a long time, and they agreed to meet again to talk some more. And soon after, McKinnon invited Parker to his church for Easter. And shortly after that, Parker decided that he had had enough. He was baptized in the church, and then weeks later, he stood before his new church, a mostly African-American congregation, and he testified. And he describes his testimony this way. He says, I, I told them that I'd been a grand dragon of the KKK, but when the Klan wasn't hateful enough, I decided to become a Nazi. And a lot, a lot of them, their draw, jaws about hit the floor and their eyes got real big. But after the service, not a single one of them had anything negative to say. They're all coming up and hugging me and shaking my hand and, you know, building me up instead of tearing me down. And I just want to say, I'm sorry, I apologize. What Con, Reverend McKinnon, and that congregation knew is that the love of God is so wide that it embraces every family on earth. And it accepts sinners where they are. It accepts us in all of our brokenness, in our hatred even. And it loves us to the place where we need to be. God's love is wide. Ephesians says, I pray that you know how long is the love of God. But well, Christ's love is long enough to endure. The passage that we read hints at how long God's love is. Ephesians says, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, forever and ever. That's a long time. You know, as you read the Bible, you realize that the people who compiled it put it together over a millennium, and then they kept it together and preserved it. In the Bible, you see the testimony of God's love affair with human beings and with all creatures with all the human families of the earth. And God's love endures through all generations, through all ages. It is forever. It not only endures a long time, it endures tough times. It endures times of unfaithfulness. It endures times that are so good that people are really distracted from God. It endures moments when it seems like there's only a small remnant left it endures. It endures so that when the time is right, in the fullness of time, as the Bible says, God sent his only son, who is the fullest manifestation of love. God sent us, Jesus, to teach us about love, and Jesus loved. He loved even when he was being betrayed and when he was being crucified. He loved. His love endured. You know, I'm so impressed by that story in the Gospel of Luke. I don't know if you know it. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, and the soldiers have come to arrest Jesus and crucify him. Jesus knows what's coming. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be really tough. And one of Jesus' disciples decides to start fighting and cuts off the ear of his soldier. And what does Jesus do? Jesus heals the man. He heals him. Christ's love, even at that point, had not run out. And it did not run out after we crucified him and God raised him from the dead, breaking the power of sin and evil and death. God's love endures for you and for me. It is wide enough to include all the families of the earth. It is long enough to endure and it will always be there. Ephesians prays that we would know 
how high the love of God is. How high. Christ's love is high enough to inspire. Elmore Parker has been a mission co-worker in, uh, in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran for well over a decade. She's an amazing person. She's spoken at a church a couple of times. And she has lots of stories of how Christians in that terrible part of the world, which has gone through so much, have tried to remain faithful. One of the stories she tells is about the Presbyterian Church in Baghdad. Yeah, there's the Presbyterian Church in Baghdad. And uh, after the Iraq War started, uh, the women of the Presbyterian Church in Baghdad decided that they needed to start a prison ministry. And so they started visiting a local women's prison. Now most of the women in the prison were widows. Their husbands had been killed in the war. And they had turned to prostitution to try to feed their families. The prisoner guards couldn't believe anybody would visit prisoners. And when they went to the guards, they were like, visit prisoners? Nobody does that. Even these women's families had disowned them because they had brought dishonor upon their families. But members of the church soldiered on and they learned that the women had a need for toiletries, so they started bringing toiletries to the prison. And they prayed with them, and they cared for them, and listened to them. And later, they started a ministry for women who were released from prison, so they would not have to return to prostitution, because when they were released from prison, they had nobody. On one visit, they noticed that a Muslim woman had made a cross out of two cigarette boxes. It hung on the wall. It was kind of odd to see a cross made out of cigarette boxes. And they asked her why she had done that. And she replied, It reminds me of Isa. Isa is the Muslim name for Jesus. She said, It reminds me of Isa. She said, Islam taught me that God is merciful. That means that God endures my failures. But Jesus teaches me that God loves me that God is for me. Even when I'm not for myself, God is for me. When I look to the cross, I know I can go on. God's love is high enough to inspire. It can inspire us to go on. Maybe you're in a difficult place this morning. Difficult place. But if you look to the love of Jesus, you can find strength to go on can give you strength when you're weak and guidance when you're confused. The love of Jesus can inspire you. It can also inspire us to reach out to the people that other people have written off. The love of Christ is wide enough to include all the families of the earth. It is long enough to endure our unfaithfulness and it is high enough to inspire us. Ephesians also prays that we would know how deep the love of Christ is. God's love is so deep, it can be the foundation for your life. Last week I served with other members of our church on the Appalachian Service Project. One of the groups, one of our groups built uh, a deck with a slope that was long enough that the owner could get her wheelchair in and out of her house. And in listening to the staff talk about this project, they, they figured that it had been a long time since this woman had been able to get out of the house because her existing ramp was so steep. Now, the first thing the group that was working on this project had to do, and there's a picture of it you can see, uh, the first thing they had to do was to dig footers for the ramp. I've dug footers before. It's, it's backbreaking work. Uh, you, you see the footers have to be deep and in that mountainous part of the country, you're gonna come across some big rocks and you have to break them up. And you have to go deep. You have to go below the frost line or the footers are no good. See, if they aren't deep enough, they can't provide a stable foundation to build on. The bigger the building, the deeper the foundation needs to be. On large buildings, they have to go all the way to bedrock. Jesus' words are bedrock. 
in his parable, he said, you know, the foolish person built on the sand, the wise person builds on the rock. And he says, whoever builds on my words will build on a solid foundation. Christ's love is so deep, it can be the foundation for your life. In the passage we read, Ephesians prays that Christ would dwell in our hearts so that we are rooted and grounded in love. That is what we want to be. We want to be rooted in and grounded in love. There are a lot of tempting alternative foundations out there. You can build your life on looks. You can build your life on some image of success. You can build your life on achieving power or fame. You can build your life on material possessions or on a job, but none of them, none of them is deep enough to be the foundation when the storms come. Every one of these things you can lose. When your image of success slips through your fingers, or when the doctor says it's cancer, or when you retire, or when someone hurts you to the core, only the love of Christ is deep enough to be a foundation that inspires you to go on and will get you through the storm. Ephesians says, I wish you to know the, the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. It surpasses our knowledge because it is so wide that it includes all the families of the earth. And it is long enough to endure our unfaithfulness. And it is high enough to inspire us. And it is deep enough to be the foundation for your life. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, uh, we, we ask uh, that you would fill us with the knowledge of God so that we too would know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ so that we might therefore be filled with all the fullness of God. We ask this in the strong name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. A couple of announcements. One is uh, we do appreciate your financial support for this ministry. Uh, we really depend upon it, and uh, you all have been so faithful through this time of pandemic. We're looking forward to uh, getting out of it and getting back to uh, more regular programming in the fall as well as uh, continuing to do our online ministry so that we can reach out to others. Uh, I do invite you to uh, financially support this, this uh, ministry and uh, thank you ahead of time for your faithfulness. Also, uh, we have a very exciting in-person Bible study at our church right now. Uh, our, it uh, meets at nine o'clock in our sanctuary and uh, we have uh, one of our most gifted Bible study leaders is leading it, and I invite you to come and participate in that. Now may the grace and the peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those only God can love wherever they may be, this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen.